I'm Kathy Gonick, and this is Not Quite Her Crowning Glory. Whatever we women may think disparagingly about our hair, too much, too little, not the right kind, the wrong color, there's no ignoring what on a good day just might be our greatest asset. From the moment our mothers first take home to infant tangles, we know we're in for a long, high maintenance relationship with the stuff. Like the one with our mothers, whether the relationship proves to be rewarding or disappointing, it will always demand our attention. Sadly for us both, my mother was never quite comfortable with hair. When she brushed mine, it hurt a little. So did her shampoos in the sink or bathtub. She pulled my hair too tight when she made braids, which somehow came out too loose. She also cut my bangs short and uneven, making me look like Mimi Eisenhower on a bad day. <laughs> I was just glad to escape what she did to herself as I watched her construct a nightly porcupinish helmet out of a million tight pin curls. When she brushed it out, she looked as dissatisfied with her reflection <laughs> as I with mine. I longed for the day when I could take my hair into my own hands or put it into those of someone who really knew what she was doing. I lived to regret that thought in seventh grade when I begged for and received my first and last professional permanent. One look in the salon mirror sent me scurrying home to a three-hour shower that I prayed would demolish those huge, surrealistically bouncing curls. It did, turning perm to frizz for the rest of the school year. The next year, my mother had her third and last baby at what was then, in 1959, considered the very late age of 42. After a couple of strangers looked first in the stroller, then at my mother's light brown hair growing gray at the temples, and asked if she was the infant's grandmother, she took to dying with a vengeance. She also permed. And as if this were not enough, she began occasionally clapping wigs over her now ash blonde permed hair. Frankly fake yet good-looking wigs the kind purchased from one's hairdresser had just come into fashion. Many women were wearing them as a new, fun way to fight bad hair days, but these were not the kind chosen by my mother. <laughs> she could have afforded the best, even ones made of real human hair, but instead bought, probably at Woolworths, the cheapest, fakest looking wigs imaginable. They were made of Dynell. <laughs> one of those new 50s materials concocted from chemicals, and were a blondish color called moon haze. I never saw anyone else wearing one, but my mother had three of them. All exactly alike, they sat on her head like ill-fitting haystacks, allowing furtive glimpses of her own dyed tresses struggling to breathe beneath them. When not on her head, they resided on other heads, white, featureless, styrofoam wig stands that she kept on the headboard of her bed, each one directly under a baby picture of one of her three, then mostly hairless, daughters. My middle sister and I remained endlessly fascinated by both the wigs and the surreal placement of the wig stands, which, despite the general liberation of hair a little later in the 60s, did not change for the next 40 years. What was our mother thinking? Almost pathologically shy and stubborn, she wasn't saying. We did know that the wig wearing began in what seemed to be a particularly trying time in her life, and thus in ours. We remembered significant anger and depression, and a lot of talk about protecting her daughters, especially me as the teenage oldest, from the evils of sexuality. It was also a time when we could see the occasional blue plastic daisy as cheaply fake as those wigs, placed in what was our mother's otherwise normal-looking garden. We found out more about that time in 1987, when the hideous shock of the stock market crash, which took with it our father's riskier investments, led our mother to reveal his earlier rash behavior. As we surely would have guessed if we'd been older, there had been another woman around. She had even been blonde. Our mother had considered divorce, looked at her three young daughters, and decided against it. 
Our father had been sincerely atoning ever since, and until just before his stock market debacle, life between them had been peaceful. Yet she had never stopped wearing those wigs. Were they some kind of statement? A passive aggressive or a truly creative way of creating a boundary? In earlier times, if she'd been an Orthodox Jew like my father's grandmother, she would have been wearing a wig from the moment she married. Her own Polish grandmother would have had her virginal hair unbraided, cut, and then capped as the most important moment of the wedding. Once that finely embroidered marital cap was in place, there was no turning back. I wonder now if my mother's wigs, in their own half-serious, half-mocking way, weren't saying the same thing. She finally retired them a few years ago when she and my father moved to an independent living place. Having lost the use of one arm due to the carelessness of a rehab center where she was sent after an operation, she was no longer truly independent. Or maybe she just didn't care. Wigs and wig stands were put into a closet and we marveled at her real, now snow white hair, cut stylishly short by her competent youngest daughter. When I brush it, I see that it's still perfectly good hair, thick with a natural wave and easy to handle, very much like my hair. Thank you.